Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Square Circle Podcast. I am your host, Marie Shadows. And on this episode of the Square Circle Podcast, I will be reviewing AEW Dark and AEW Dynamite. I am taking you guys back a couple weeks. I missed two days because I was completely frustrated and wanted to get the recent AEW Dynamite episode out of the way. I haven't heard any, any comments yet on my recent AEW Dynamite review. Still waiting for it. It's out there. If you guys want to listen to it after this podcast, you can definitely go check that out. And you could also sign up to the Square Circle Podcast Wrestling Newsletter, squaredcirclepodcast.substack.com, and read about wrestling news and updates and my thoughts more on certain things I didn't cover in these podcasts. So for now, we will be reviewing AEW Dark that debuted on April 21st, 2020. And then right after that, we're going to go straight into AEW Dynamite that debuted April 22nd, 2020. I will be doing the same review style, talk about the matches, break it down, and also cover two important topics in this podcast episode. Topic one would be the importance of having vignettes and or promos in relation to who are these local wrestlers that keep appearing on AEW Dynamite. The second one is a comment about Tony Khan's recent comments on Twitter about the creative process and why that needs to be a little bit more structured. But we'll get to that towards the end. For right now, let's jump right into it. The opening match for AEW Dark was a women's match. This match was a very good match. I'm happy to see the women getting some spotlight, getting some time in because the women of AEW is really packed and they all deserve some type of time on the show. Whether it's on AEW Dark, AEW Dynamite, or just some skits and vignettes. I am familiar with Penelope Ford's work. She is a very she is a very talented wrestler and a very talented manager. She has the full package, and I'm happy that she's with AEW. Anna J is new to the scene. She is out of Atlanta, Georgia. She is also a trainee. So you would think that someone who's green wouldn't put up a very good fight in this match, but Anna J held her own, and I am very impressed with her. From her look to her entrance to the way she handled herself in the ring. I think on Twitter, someone had mentioned that this was her 10th official match in the business. And it looks like with more training, more experience, she's going to be one hell of a wrestler. I love the fact that she comes out looking like Santana from D.C., we could add some more elements to it later on when she gets the personality in. She has the personality in the world. Just, oh, you're like a magician. Oh, okay. You know, magician. Oh, okay. You know, behind her character should be something magical. She should have a unique finisher for her presence. So that way, when she comes out, you automatically know what she's about. You automatically understand her character. You automatically understand her growth match before and after, before and after. During the match, of course, Kip is at the side of Penelope Ford, and he was once again being a distraction. Ford does her... And then her Matrix-style bridge into a neckbreaker, and then gives Anna J the fisherman suplex with a bridge pin. That ends up being the finisher of the match, and that allows Penelope Ford to pick up the win. Anna J did get some offense in here and there. No matter what, that match showed that she has a very, very bright future. And I'm excited that she, even though she could have still worked the indies a little bit to gain more experience, rather than pushing her into... You never want to have someone have an embarrassing moment because they're still completely green on the scene. And if she were to be out in the Indies for a little bit, make a name for herself, gain experiences that she will probably later on experience if she ever decides to leave AEW, you know, it might be a little too late. But AEW has the best trainers 
and they could definitely teach her a lot of stuff for like character wise wrestling wise so it's not that big of a deal but then again because she just started her wrestling career i'd rather her make mistakes out in the indies than make mistakes inside of a company that you're supposed to be at your very best at your very top level you can go train at the nightmare factory you could go train at any of the other schools in atlanta but the one thing that will always get you over and get you the most experience so you can understand how the business works indies that you're looking for if you could just do it on the indies the next match on AEW dark is a surprising one it's joe alonzo versus cody last AEW dark sammy guevara teased his buddy joe alonzo that he was going to be facing Moxley. So Joe Alonzo was preparing himself and taking DDT bumps on the hotel bed. I think it's stupid. Why would you want to do that? You could probably injure yourself early, but you know, let them be themselves. Only to find out that he was fighting Jake Hager. He lost to Jake Hager that time. And even Sammy got in and intervened. And it was like, what are you doing, man? Like, why are you doing that to your friend? I think it was kind of fucked up, but it was funny either way. If it wasn't for the Sammy Guevara vlogs, I would have never known who Joe Alonzo is and was. Any of his matches. He gets a lot of unnecessary heat. This is a young star that knows how to work an audience. The major heat that he was getting is that a couple times a year, Twitter would do this hashtag of women who watch wrestling or selfie. Women who watch wrestling take selfies and feel empowered and not feel like they feel ugly or anything like that. Um, I think it's called ha- it's hashtag fine women of wrestling. Um, which are just wrestling fans. They take selfies, they put it up and, you know, men do gawk at them, but Joe was playing a heel and Joe was calling them ugly and the whole entire Twitter turned on him for no reason. If you guys have the balls to put up a selfie of yourself on Twitter, but yet then when someone says that you're ugly, you know, just ignore it, block them, mute them. It, takes two seconds to either look him up on google or look up on his profile you'll know that he's a wrestler to give him all that backlash just because he was saying some women are ugly some this some that whatever however it went down it's really stupid that could have just you know been avoided it's like it's really stupid that could have just you know been avoided it's like you put up a selfie on a public forum that anybody can comment on and you want to get mad at somebody doing their job was it smart no they're ugly it's like a whole shit storm It's like, don't put up something if you don't want the attention, but you put it up to get the attention. Then when you get the wrong type of attention, you don't know how to handle that as an adult. Simple. You either block the person, you either ignore the person, you either mute the person. Like Twitter gives you a lot of buttons. And for some reason, if you didn't like what Joe Alonzo said to you about your picture, you know, you could have just been like, hey, I'm going to block your ass. I don't know who you are. I just want positive attention. That's all I want. You can tailor your Twitter timeline to what attention you want. And this goes for both men and female. It does not matter. But to give Joe all that backlash for no reason and almost try to cancel this guy's career, just because he was quote unquote hating on a couple of pictures, please grow up and probably almost 90% of those women don't know the product, don't know wrestling. And sometimes 
Just so, to join in, and I know you're not everything. Really you know, know, you know, you don't know the first thing about that. That was way too much. You guys have to like, so, stop that. The other thing, I will you just get friends want to be more. included in that aspect everything of via the end. That was way too much. Doesn't mean you should. The other thing, you would get heat for in the middle of the night, crying and telling that I'm not even being blamed for calling people in the middle of the night, crying and telling them that their family member and allegedly being blamed for calling people in the middle of the night crying and telling them that their family member had passed away you know why would somebody want to do that you can tell that why would somebody want to do that you can tell that joe alonzo still acts like a kid here and there he's still you know a young guy but um i would think by this time he would know better sometimes we get on people who are like in their early 20s because they still do stupid shit but i think Joe is smart enough to know right from wrong. There was no proof behind this stuff, but people on Twitter take it as the Bible, as if it's true, without any type of facts behind it. I don't think Joe would do anything like that. Um, if anything, you know, I would think that his that he'll be way more afraid of what his mom is capable of in terms of punishing him than calling somebody in the middle of the night to say that your family member died. But other than that, his match with Cody showed what he's capable of. And even though I did not know anything of his character, and I'm guessing his character is just being himself the same way that Sammy is being himself a uh, gimmick. There was a point in this match that which I appreciate. So in the beginning of the match, Cody tries to chain wrestle Alonzo. They try to go hold for hold. Cody brings out his amateur style wrestling. After some chain wrestling, both men shoot off from the ropes. Cody tries to do a shoulder tackle to Joe, but this allows Joe to kick up and Joe does a really awesome stance. I want to see more of Joe Alonzo. I understand that he can be a very great heel and a very great asset to AEW, especially him versus Sammy. Like, I really want to see that happen. I would think that they have the best chemistry in the world. They will put on a really great show. They're very similar, but Sammy will take more risk and pull things out of his hat. I don't know too much about Joe Alonzo's style. But this match between him and Cody was a good warm up for casual fans to get introduced to him. So if he wasn't on the vlogs, it would be a little hard to translate that in this match to be like, it would be a little hard to translate that in this match to be like, why should I root for you? Why should I care about you? Like if I wasn't searching on Twitter, like if I wasn't searching on Twitter for Joe Alonzo to see what he's doing, and all this backlash, and I just see him on TV because I just want to not be on social media, how would that match tell me I should root for this guy? Automatically, you would think that, oh, he's a jobber. Oh, he's not, you know, he's not going to win against Cody. He's just a loco, stuff like that. But because of Joe's involvement in the vlogs, helps you determine, even if you don't know his background that well. After that, Cody goes to give him a handshake, but then Joe Alonzo does an arm drag to Cody from that and then kicks Cody in the back. Alonzo does an Irish whip to Cody. Cody then jumps. Alonzo slides under Cody and then Cody goes to move to the middle of the ring and ends up snapping off a power slam to Alonzo. Cody is now taking the advantage by having Alonzo suspended with a delayed vertical suplex. Cody introduces a submission, which is the Gale Lock from Gale Kim, and places it on Joe Alonzo. Joe Alonzo taps, and that is how Cody wins this AEW dark match. From start to finish, it was lighthearted. It was fun. I understood Joe Alonzo's character, and I'm happy that he was able to get a match AEW again.
close out AEW Dark. All right, guys, now time to review AEW Dynamite that premiered on April 22nd, 2020. This was the most talked about AEW episode on Twitter because there was a huge debate about enhancement talent. Not many people understand what AEW is doing when it comes to their enhancement talent. Their enhancement talent are just the local guys. I would talk briefly about enhancement talent when we get to a certain match and then talk about the importance of why these local guys need some type of promo, some type of vignette, so that way I can understand them. And first, let's jump right into it. AEW Dynamite opens up with a video package for the TNT Championship Tournament. This is led by Cody doing a promo. In my notes, I wrote that it felt like a Captain America-esque type passion for the business. He obviously has passion for the fact that the network TNT came to him. The network TNT came to him and the AEW company and was like, hey, we want to have a TNT championship tournament and we want you to be a part of it. And we want this belt to be on TV and everything like that. So the TNT championship title is definitely a tv belt we get into one of the matches for the tnt tournament which is sammy guevara versus darby you know that with sammy versus darby you're going to get a very good match their online exchanges are okay darby has the upper hand because he's into more of being creative and theatrical storytelling vignettes so this match opens up with a very quick fight sammy flies over the top rope onto darby that's the surprise attack before the bell sammy does a body splash on darby on the ladder not even before the match begins sammy is on the attack thinking that if he can weaken his opponent he could probably get the upper hand and that's a very smart tactic that's something that chris jericho would teach A fellow student of his, that's something that Chris Jericho would do in his career. So that was a very good move. We all know that Sammy wanted to get his hands on Darby for a while. So why not do it like this? Finally, after that, the match gets started. Darby kicks up. He mentions that his foot, it was a time when Sammy was fighting against the... No, Sammy was fighting against the... It was no. a time when Sammy did a run in was going to it was do a, a time springboard when Sammy move. did a run- it was a time when Sammy did a run in was going to do a springboard move and Matt Jackson of the Young Bucks caught him with a super kick and Sammy rolled his ankle. So ever since that incident happened up until now it's been healing it's been well but Darby went to go attack the ankle. So Darby continues to work on the ankle do a springboard cutter then Darby does another ankle lock onto Sammy so that way Sammy could give up. But then there's fists flying back and forth, and that's to break the lock. Now there's a forearm exchange. Darby, Darby missed a suicide dive. Sammy does some crazy ass flip onto Darby. Darby grabs the rope when Sammy goes for the pin for that. There was an amazing offense encounters during this match. However, Darby puts on the Last Supper, which is a submission move pin that he takes both the legs, somehow pretzels them, and then bam, um, ends up picking the victory because it's hard to kick out of that when your legs are tied up it was a very fast-paced match you thought that sammy had the upper hand in the beginning of the match but then darby ends up beating sammy with a leg lock pin there we go it's a leg lock pin called the last supper that's way better than everything that i said how i described it now there's an interesting segment in this match that needs to be discussed so In contrast to what we saw on AEW Dynamite on April 29th, where Darby was attacking Cody Rhodes' knee, there's a difference in this. So one would have to assume that maybe Darby does really study his opponents. And if he does study his opponents, he will know certain weaknesses. He will know how to counter certain things. And because Sammy and Darby had multiple matches together already, leading up to the TNT Championship Tournament. Maybe Darby watched his vlogs. 
arena. So sometimes Darby is in it, so he might overhear Sammy talk about his foot if someone asks him about his foot or watch previous episodes of Sammy explaining about his foot and his ankle and what's the progress of healing on it, right? So that made sense for Darby to go after the ankle for Sammy. So that way maybe Sammy can tap. That's what you do. When it came to Darby versus Cody and Darby all of a sudden was attacking Cody Rhodes' knee, that's that's the difference there. And that's what I was getting upset about. It's like, I know about Cody Rhodes' knee. How far back Darby went to go search for that. There was no evidence of that. At least with Sammy, we can make the argument of if Darby really want to study his opponent, you watch his content. Cody ever put out that type of content. That's why I will I would get upset at Cody versus Darby versus now in the last podcast episode, I mentioned that for Darby's for Darby's character, it would not seem like him to now for anyone that says that that might be hypocritical of me, it's not. In Sammy versus Darby, it's not. In Sammy versus Darby, Cody versus Darby, Cody showed him that, hey, you need to attack the knee. They probably even talked about it in the back when they were talking about the matches. Hey, look, I have a knee. I had knee surgery. I want you to attack it. It'll amp, it'll amp up the story, which it didn't. You know, so Darby knew. Sam, I had knee surgery. I want you to attack it. It'll amp, it'll amp up the story, which it didn't, you know. So Darby knew. In the back of your mind, you knew Darby probably watched Sammy's vlogs just to understand his opponent more because he wants to win the CNC Championship Tournament very, very much. And he wants to eventually fight Cody Rhodes again. So. That's the difference. And it's not hypocritical if anyone out there thought so. I want to try to give these matches a fair shake and tell you that this was good because of this way and that was bad because of that way. And analyze the characters that we see on the screen. Meticulous, thought-out character. What he is, what he does, and how he does things. Darby would do anything. He is relentless. He is one of the best. He understands the business. So in his character, he tends to study his opponents. So that way he knows what to work on and what not to get surprised by. If it just happens in the match where someone tweaked their knee or tweaked their elbow, then he could definitely go after that specific body part. But if it is shown to him, then yeah, that's where I'm like, character wise, Darby wouldn't do that. If anything, character wise, Darby will work on a body part just because he knows that's a veteran type of move. He knows that if he works on a body part, maybe his opponent won't have enough strength to put on a submission if they're like a submission specialist or their finisher is a, is a submission. Or if their opponent uses their hands and their arms a lot and they need that upper body strength. And now that you're working on that specific body part, you won't have enough strength to try to knock out your opponent. So that's that's the difference between and Darby versus Cody and why I'm more upset towards Cody versus Darby than I am with Sammy versus Darby. After the match, we have an amazing Matt Hardy slash Damascus promo where Matt Hardy is schizophrenic and it's it's amazing. All right, match two is Kenny Omega versus Alan Angel. This is where we're going to be talking about enhancement talent. Normally and usually enhancement talent from the area uh, come in, have a match, and you automatically know that this enhancement talent is a jobber. For some reason, we've been using the phrase enhancement talent a lot and not calling people jobbers, but AEW is changing how we look at jobbers. 
and how we look at enhancement talents. For the sake of this podcast and for the sake of wrestling in general, enhancement talent will be synonymous with jobbers, depending on the context. I got to add that, depending on the context. So everybody on Twitter got upset that Kenny Omega allowed this Allen Angel guy to have some offense in and to have almost a six minute match with him. And I'm like, you guys just want to complain just to complain. Everybody's been complaining about Kenny Omega since day one of AEW and they don't know what they want. Fans do not know what they want. They want something. It's given to them. They backlash. They want something it's not given to them it's backlash it's like what do you guys really want the wrestlers are doing their best to entertain everyone the wrestlers are doing their best to include everyone but yet that it's never good enough and that's the sad part about this business is that they give 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 but then the fans don't want to equally give us back and maybe cut some people some slack and maybe think outside the box. You know, there's a reason why Kenny Omega picks and chooses how he wrestles, who he wrestles, how much aggressiveness he shows, how much creative does he show? Remember guys, Kenny Omega is not a full-time wrestler at the moment. He is a wrestler. He is also an EVP. So he has EVP responsibilities when it comes to dealing with the women's division And then he also has his wrestler responsibilities and he's trying to juggle everything all at once. And it may not be to your liking, but then again, does that fit fit with how Kenny wants to book himself? Just because that's how Kenny wants to book himself. The only thing that he has to do is go to WWE. The only thing that he has to do is go to WWE. And if he wants to do WWE, Kenny Omega will be no more. Guys, we know that that's true. They understand how they like you to book yourself. Kenny will be one just because you are all their program. WWE was not the kind of record with all their program. They signed. Does not mean that profile guys that they signed. They understand really how to high deal profile with guys Kenny that they like video games to make sure that they deal with me. Kenny, Kenny Omega was big into writers who can show that they have one way to angel like, attack. Just because you watch WWE 24-7 with all their programming does not mean that the guys that they sign, really high profile guys that they sign, they understand how to deal with them. Kenny would be way too constricted with creative. Writers don't know how to write Kenny Omega. Like, how hard is it to know that Kenny Omega likes video games? Kenny Omega likes anime? Kenny Omega was big in Japan? Kenny Omega has a one-winged angel attack. And Kenny Omega likes to do storylines that matter to him and likes to do storylines that make sense and storylines that push boundaries. His whole entire storyline with the Golden Lovers, that thing pushed boundaries. That story was amazing. That was a simple story that that basically said love is love. It does not matter. And Kenny paves the way for a lot of wrestlers today in the business. And Kenny paves the way for great storytelling in the business. And to give him shit because he doesn't do what you want him to do. Like, last I checked, he's a grown-ass man. You should be a grown-ass person, too. Like, professional wrestlers give us so much, and sometimes fans are, like, completely ungrateful. So, the interesting thing about this particular match is that apparently it's been a year in the making, a awesome Kenny Omega and Alan Angel had met before in the past, and I was like, oh, that's interesting, they brought him back, he was in town, so why not have a match? And... I'm guessing Kenny had picked them personally. And that's also another thing that you guys should cheer about is that these wrestlers have the ability to pick who they want to wrestle and show to the world why these guys are important. However, I know nothing about Alan Angel, right? So automatically, I'm going to think that he's going to be a jobber to Kenny Omega and that, you know, he's just an enhancement talent make Kenny look good and that's it right we'll just go about our day it's gonna be a squash match but no this is where Kenny Omega's genius kicks in 
And no one gives him credit for his genius at all. From start to finish in this match, I knew exactly who Alan Angels was. He did not need a vignette. He did not need a promo package or anything. I knew that he was a guy that can stand up to Kenny Omega and will give Kenny Omega a run for his money. He's also the guy, too, that can probably have some good storylines and be very good part of, be very good part of the team of AEW. Would I like to see more of Kenny Omega versus Allen Angels? Sure, I would definitely love to see that. Would I like to see Allen Angels in AEW fighting some other guys? Sure, because I want to see how well he works with other personalities that's not very Kenny Omega-esque, where Kenny Omega is speed, power, endurance, strength, and goofiness, which is five major things. And this is why him and Cabana work so well together. So this is how the match went. Angels bites down on Kenny's hand, and that allows Angels to have some offense against Kenny. Kenny does a backbreaker and fall away slam to Angels. And Angels then get some offense in by attacking Kenny in the corner. There's a chin breaker to Kenny from Angels, and then Angel uses the apron to his advantage. He pulled it out from under Kenny's feet, then proceeds to do a double drop kick to Kenny. There is a spin kick to Kenny from Angels, and then when Kenny has enough, because during this match, Kenny was definitely playing around with Angels, and Kenny does the Snapdragon Suplex to Angels, which always looks devastating. Usually, guys do not kick out of the V-Trigger. However, when that argument was made, the V-Trigger is not... When that argument was made... Wrestling Twitter needs to get it right. So Kenny proceeds to do a power bomb into a V trigger, and that allows Kenny Omega to pick up the win against Alan Angel. The debate on Twitter about this being an enhancement talent, and you know, the jobbers are supposed to make the wrestlers look good. Traditional words are changing, especially in the wrestling business. Big guy does another move to the little guy, pins, walks out to the back. Bam, he got paid. He's going home, and that's it. In AEW, what it means to be an enhancement talent is that not only do you make your opponent look good, the person you're fighting has to equally return the favor. This was a good show. In AEW, what it means to be an enhancement talent is that not only do you make your opponent look good, the person you're fighting has to equally return the favor. This was a good showing because there's a lack of vignettes for these guys, right? So all I know about AEW is the elite Cody and other people I've seen on WWE programming or other in the federations around the United States and also in like New Japan. So like I'm familiar with most of the wrestlers, people like Alan Angel, we're going to get to more, but like, for example, Musa, Cody Rhodes or a high profile match against the Young Bucks and you're basically a local, if you don't allow that local to show what they have in the ring, then why should I care about them coming back next week? If anything, instead of putting the local against a high profile wrestler, why not just have high profile wrestler versus someone within the company that's also known? Like, for example, instead of getting Alan Angels to fight Kenny Omega, how come Kenny Omega couldn't fight, like, you know, or... Sammy or something like that, like Sammy or something like that. Like if 
people were going to complain so badly about some time, then they should have just went with Kenny Omega versus an established AEW star so that there wouldn't be an argument. But if that were to happen, Twitter is always going to complain about it. And it's always going to be a complaint towards Kenny Omega. The point is, is that sometimes if you don't have enough time, Let them get some offense in, let them get their character in, let them get their charisma in, so that way I could connect with them and go on social media and be like, hey, I want to see Alan Angels again in AEW because he surprised me against Kenny Omega. And that is the truth. I really want Alan Angels to be in AEW because I believe his personality fits, his style fits. And if he could put up a good fight against Kenny Omega, imagine the storylines that he could create with other potential AEW stars. These local talent, on the other hand, are going to show up week after week because of the situation that we're in and the location that they're in. And not every person on the roster can fly in to do a regular AEW taping. So they have to get from the local. They have to get from the schools. So, you know, they have to work with what they got, but they also have enough time on their hands to create a vignette. Like, how hard is it? To call up the person that you're going to have on the show for that week to be like, hey, in advance, I need you to make a two minute video of you explaining who you are, your character, you know, be you, be a wrestler. Get in touch with Alan and be like, hey, I need you to make a promo, two minutes of something to explain to the fans who you are, why they should, you know, like you, what's your story, what's your charisma. They could have did that with all of their locos. And that's what I was getting frustrated about is that we see loco after loco after loco. And even in these matches, there's no charisma bouncing off. The only charisma's bouncing off is Alan Angel. Anna J, Joe Alonzo, those are the three out of all the locals that have been showing up for the past couple of weeks. Those are the ones that stick in my mind, and those are the ones I want to see more of because their charisma popped out on the screen for me to be like, hey, I want to get to know them, make sure that you guys have some background stories about them and stuff like that. Like what they did in, in the beginning when AEW first started. email address or this Dropbox folder or this Google Drive folder or this OneDrive folder and, you know, the talented video editors of AEW can put it together, have a vignette, bam, play it on the show and it'll feel like an actual high production start to finish AEW show. Why haven't they been doing that? Our next match is... This match, from what I remember, this match was weird. And weird in the fact that almost for, let's just say, 10 minutes, maybe the 15-minute mark, it's as simple as that. However, I don't have that much notes because it was just havoc. 
doing a lot of hardcore stuff. Havoc taking advantage of Orange Cassidy. Orange Cassidy didn't get the upper hand in until his until he did a DDT to. I don't have that much notes because it was just Havoc doing a lot of hardcore stuff. Havoc taking advantage of Orange Cassidy. Cassidy didn't get the upper hand until he did a suicide dive with a crossbody, a swinging DDT, and that allowed for some space to happen, and that allowed for Cassidy to get his But why couldn't it be even? Orange Cassidy knows how to fight. Orange Cassidy is, is a wrestler. He can sidestep certain things. Like, I don't know. There was a distraction from Ford and Kip. Both of them come out to distract Orange Cassidy. Then best friends come out. Um, it ends up, I don't know if it ends up being in a DQ. Because I didn't write the finish. But I did say that Orange Cassidy won. I think it was a DQ. This leads to best friends of Orange Cassidy well, mainly best friends, getting angry that Kip and Ford keep interfering in like their matches and stuff like that. And this is why um, when it came to the April 29th show, that's why we had that match. The match wasn't good or bad. I just, you know, don't want We don't need that's like, you know, we're so programmed about WWE because they've done everything first. Well, the after territories WWE bought up most of the territories, first they things, did everything but first. But nobody really remembers the first stuff the that they did. There's only a handful of stuff that a lot of you, know, you could probably like, things, talk about, but, but nobody really stuff remembers that we are the first so stuff that they did. There's only a handful of from stuff WWE, that you, know, you could probably like, talk tag, about, but most hot comebacks stuff that and we are, stuff that we are so used to from WWE, the hot tags, the hot comebacks, and the comebacks happen when somebody gets beat up and there's only one side, and all of a sudden the person fires up and then like has their comeback and they have their moment to shine, and sometimes they either get stopped midway or they do the whole thing, and then like it's just one, two, three, bam, that's it, we go home. And that needs to change, and that's what was happening on the 29th show that exact formula aside from that we get an mjf he has a hangnail we'll see him this week on aw dynamite the fourth match i literally put in my notes in my notes wardlow power off lee tried air placement wardlow is your winner wardlow is a big guy in the last podcast they need to they need to stop having Warlow squash these guys. Warlow versus any local wrestler is the definition and the epitome of squashing local guys. That is that does not make them enhancement talent for Warlow. That just makes it a simple big guy comes out, big guy squashes little guy, big guy goes home. That's it. That's a squash match. We don't get upset for that, but we get upset for Kenny Omega. I don't understand how or why. Stuff like that is never going to change. And, you know, for Cody to comment on Twitter that Warlow is going to have some great things coming ahead, you know, they just, he just has to do the work. How is he going to do the work if all AEW is doing is feeding him and feeding us, the audience, jobbers? Again, I don't know what Lee Johnson is supposed to represent. His name is very generic. His name is very bland. Who is Lee Johnson? What does he have that I can relate to? All this stuff that goes into making a wrestling character, people get so caught up with learning the foundation and the basics. And if Wardlow keeps squashing these local guys, how am I ever going to get to know who they are, what they represent, and their story? Who is Lee Johnson? The first thing I always think of when someone is named Lee is that Wardlow keeps squashing these local guys. How am I ever going to get to know who they are, 
what they represent, and their story. Who is Lee Johnson? The first thing I always think of when someone is named Lee is that they are inspired by Bruce Lee, or they watch anime, and they're a huge fan of Naruto, and there's Lee Sensei, and they have their inspirations from that. What inspirations do these local talents have that... Once Lee Johnson finds who he is, then he'll probably be a big hit. There is a Brody Lee segment after this, and I think that segment was about more people joining the Dark Order. And I love the fact that Brody Lee is front and center with his Dark Order uh, team and everything that goes into production and everything that is said is really good. Um, it might be a spoof off of Vince McMahon, but... Brody Lee does it to a whole nother, a level where it affects you and you feel the emotion. You feel like, oh, shit, maybe I do want to follow him. It's so good that it definitely feels like a cult. So right after this segment. Is he a wrestler by day and a lawyer by night? Is he a lawyer by day and a wrestler by night? Brody Lee is the winner of this match. There's some chops and some some kicks. Do Brody Lee, Justin tries, um, and then Brody Lee does a disco lariat, which is a clothesline, and that's it, that ends the match. The main event of AEW Dynamite tournament match. This is Kip versus Dustin. So this is the 22nd show. That previous Wednesday, or it could have been that same week where they showed the road to the TNT Championship Tournament, and the marketing behind having Dustin say if he doesn't beat Kip, that he would retire, right? The marketing behind that was really stupid. I would have never gone that route. Um, there has to be a time where someone sits down with the roads and tells them that the stuff that worked back in the day to grab on people's heartstrings is getting old, is getting repetitive, and is getting predictable, right? Now, the upset would have been that if Dustin actually did lose the Kip, that would have shocked everybody. That would have been like, okay, maybe you were like serious about maybe stopping wrestling and just being a coach for AEW. But to be like, and then all of a sudden on Twitter have this whole sympathy fest for Dustin and people coming out of left and right to be like, you're the man, Dustin. You know, we have always believed in you, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, this is such petty sympathy that didn't need to happen. And then for Dustin to be like, I didn't think I still have fans. I would understand if the Rhodes family name meant nothing to professional wrestling for someone to say that they didn't think they had fans. Because you carry such a very heavy legacy, like having the Rhodes last name, you will always have fans, no matter what. Fans are everywhere. He has fans. established you have a legacy, like, you have a career. It's These just young guys annoying are that so they're doing they everything in their heart power strings. to get the name out there, to get remembered. Just but to be you the as a veteran face. don't have to do and that I'm like, as much. Has to be so maybe I can sort of be, sort of be like, all right, maybe you human. can do that, but... And I guess being he human is being scared if you like, can't perform at top level. It's just but annoying that ever since they will pull out heart strings. was wrestling on TV, like... Just I mean, to be the like ultimate baby face. AEW. Not and like, like TV in general. There has to be some type of um, game. Not like be some all the way back then for his career. Being human. He started doing and the Canadian Destroyer. And I guess being Destroyer. human is being scared if like, he can't perform at top you're level. You're going to gain new fans for doing a move that does like... I just mean, to be like, the ultimate baby AEW. face. Not like and TV like, in general. There has to be some type um, of game. Not like has to be some type of his career. being human. He started doing a and Canadian I guess Destroyer. Being human is being scared like, if you can't perform at top you're gonna level. Gain but new fans for doing a move since that Dustin you was wrestling on TV. Shouldn't like, be doing, but I mean, you know, like, you AEW, can do it as long as like you don't TV get hurt. As long as the other guy does uh, AEW, not like TV in general. Um, not like all the way back then for his career. But it's the same old formula to pull at the heartstrings of fans. 
You didn't need to do that. You didn't need to say that if I can't beat Kip, that I'm going to retire. Because then he beats Kip. Sorry, spoiler alert. I didn't get to my notes. I usually get to my notes and then tell you guys who wins. But he beats Kip. And that should have been almost like a... When you go against Lance Archer, you don't know if you're surviving to live another day when you're in the ring with Lance Archer. That would have been perfect for that, but not against a young kid named Kip. You have so many years over Kip. Like, how how does that make sense? I understand that Kip is young, he's agile, he's great looking, like he has talent. But how does that compare to you being the veteran and you could pull out any move anytime and play dirty because you've seen it all, you've been but no, they had to go the route of the emotional thing and being like, I'm going to retire because a young kid beat me. It it was just really, really bad marketing on their end just to get people hyped up for it. You know, it feels good to tell someone that you support them and tell someone that, no, you got all the talent in the world and stuff like that. I don't know. Me personally, I would not want to be 100 percent babied. I would not want to be 100 percent feeling all the sympathy in the world from people to be like, oh, my God, no, don't retire. You still got it. Sometimes if your body is aching, you might want to just like take a take a step back. Kip has a really incredible speed. He is going toe to toe with Dustin with the basics. Um, at one point, Penelope Ford is going to be a distraction. So she grabs Dustin's foot. Kip does an insiguri. Ford again becomes a distraction, choking Dustin. Kip is then taking the advantage and Kip does a heel hook to apply pressure on a knee. Kip then does a drop kick. Dustin does a crucifix pin. Dustin does a scoop slam, but Kip uses his weight to get a pin. There is a knee lift and a lariat from Kip to Dustin. And then Dustin does a spine buster. And then after that, a power slam to Kip. Penelope Ford keeps distracting. Brandy had enough. Brandy does a spear. And then Dustin hits the Canadian Destroyer. And then Dustin hits the Canadian Destroyer. continues with his legacy he keeps his career but then he falls victim to lance archer and i think that there needs to be a change in how matches are done when it comes to cody rhodes and dustin rhodes they do the same stuff every single time the same formulas the same working on a body part and stuff. And sometimes not everyone is going to catch it. Okay. I understand that. And I don't want to destroy the illusion and your happiness when I do these things. So I can understand if people don't really want to hear it. That's, that's what I do. I analyze this stuff to make it better instead of making it so obvious and so tiresome these are ways that they can improve. You know, the fact that Dustin does this Canadian destroyer, one, it's weird because he's a tall ass guy. Two, congratulations. It defies gravity. You're able to still do amazing things that these young guys can do to stay relevant. Three, you know, sometimes in the business, you shouldn't be doing moves that don't make sense. And you shouldn't be doing moves that if it's not part of your character, and I remember watching the AEW podcast of Unrestricted and Dustin was on there and Dustin explained the fact that he half paints his face now so that way we could have the natural Dustin Rhodes. And then if someone pushes him way too far and breaks that boundary, he becomes this sort of like demon and that's why I'm like, are you sure you understand what character you want to play now? Like you know, always in the shadow of everything else. And, you know, I don't know when they're going to really give him a push. I feel like it's one of those sob stories and sob songs where it's like, 
I'm going to do better today, guys, and I'm going to put 100% in, and yeah, I'm going to do this with all you guys' strength behind me, and then all of a sudden, the person loses, and it's like, guys, I'm sorry, I failed you guys, can you guys forgive me, tomorrow's another day, we'll do it again, it seems like it's that, it's that rotation, it's, it's the rotation of, I'm going to hype you guys up, I'm going to tell you guys a bunch of false things, and I know that my outcome is I'm going to lose the match. Or even if he does win, it's the same thing. And I think I'm tired now of hearing sob stories. I'd rather hear, yeah, he got the best of me today. But I'm going to continue to train and follow up on it by doing videos and putting it out on social media. Like, I was never the one to be like, I want to pry into your life all the time. But as the character, I want to make sure that, you know, you can connect with me and make me want to stay with you on this journey. So that way I can continue to support you and continue to be like, all right, you know, he needs to be a main eventer already. He needs to have a bell on him. Look at all the hard work that he's done. Look at all the videos that he's put out. Look at all the, the, all the content he created. Why is he not a champion? You know, stuff like that. Like we're living in a day and age where people can take advantage of social media but sometimes not everyone does it. And if you want to have your name out there, you should be able to do it so that people know about you. That's the only reason why certain wrestlers get booked on certain shows and why certain wrestlers are and hitting all their goals and it just making doesn't new goals and hitting those feel goals. That way. There's a lot of empty parts and I might like, know, be really there's a reason why stuff. they put in the work. But there's an importance and sometimes to build a brand it to just build yourself and to build feel that way. There's a lot local of feel that way. There's a lot of empty parts and I might like be really nitpicking that stuff, but there's an importance to build a brand, to build yourself and to build the local guys that could eventually become stars. I'm not saying for all of the veterans to move aside in AEW. I'm saying for the veterans to work along with the new guys and to have a smarter direction and have a little bit more stricter direction. And now this is where I'm going to get into Tony Khan's comments. Um, and this is just paraphrasing because I'm, I'm not going to read the actual one, but everyone on the internet saw it. The dirt sheets have them up on their website as articles. But Tony Khan does all the writing he approves and he doesn't wait around for people to pitch things to him as much as i commend him for doing all of that they can all sit together and they can all talk about it and that's what i felt like when it first started it felt like all of them were in the room talking about stuff doing this doing that and that's why it felt so good that's why i believed in the pro all of them we're in the room talking about stuff, doing this, doing that. And that's why it felt so good. That's why I believed in the product of it being the alternative. I know that he writes the stuff and he loves what he does. So he, the board game. And I'm not saying to be Vince McMahon. I'm not saying that because you could be opposite of Vince McMahon and you can be your own person. And I'm not saying to be Vince McMahon. I'm not saying that. Because you could be opposite of Vince McMahon and you can be your own person. And he's clearly his own person. I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying that not every idea is a good idea. You can't always do it by yourself. And as a writer, this is true. You cannot always do it by yourself. The thing that bothers me is that even if you do write the whole entire show you're not really waiting around for people to pitch ideas to you. Why would you want to wait around for people to pitch ideas to you? If you have like a general outline for what's going to be happening for the next two weeks and you think that two people are good to go, like, you know, if we focus on the tag team division, right? So let's say we haven't seen Private Party in a very, very long time. zoom meeting and talk about how you have this idea of like all right you guys are gonna 
have this feud. Th- these are my ideas. This is how we're going to start out. This is going to be the middle. This is going to be the end. What do you guys think? Like, let's plan this out. Like, you can also go to them and be like, hey, I have this idea. You know, what do you think about it? Do you think we could flesh this out? Do you think we can expand this? You know, um, or like you can text people and be like, hey, if you have ideas, give it to me now and let's work on them. You know, you're still being proactive. You're not waiting for them to come to you. It's not like how we hear the stories in WWE where people go to Vince and they're like, hey, I want to pitch you this idea. Sure, if somebody wants to pitch you an idea, let them do it if that's how they feel comfortable. You know, but you also have the power to go to them and be like, hey, does this make sense for your character? Would your character do do this? Or if you're stuck with someone's character, go talk to them and be like, hey, um, I came up with this idea. I came up with this angle, but I'm a little stuck because I'm not sure if your character will do this. Would you hear me out? It just seems a little power hungry that he would take on everything on his own and not have the right team. Like I said in the last podcast episode, you're not going to be hiring 100 writers. There's no need for you to hire 100 writers to get shows done for AEW, like how WWE has it, right? As much as Tony Khan gives us what we want, sometimes you have to take a seat back and also, you know, do what's best for the storytelling. Do what's best for the characters. And obviously do what's best for business. But main thing do what's best for characters do what's best for storylines don't just do what's best for what's hot right now what could get us 15 minutes of fame what could get us ticket sales what could get us money right away like there's a reason why the young bucks and kenny are so there's a reason why the young bucks are uh, there's a reason why the young bucks and kenny omega are so successful And that's because of their long-term booking, their organic marketing, and them just testing things out. There was a lot of things that, you know, didn't probably work. And, you know, they realized it and they went with something else and that worked. You know, do what's best for the storytelling. Do what's best for the characters. And obviously do what's best for business. But main thing, do what's best for characters. Do what's best for storylines. Don't just do what's best for what's hot right now, what could get us 15 minutes of fame, what could get us ticket sales, what could get us money right away. Like It's the same thing in the writing world, in the publishing world. When you finally write your novel and you have it edited and everything, there's a person who writes the blurb in the back of that book. That blurb determines whether or not you as a consumer, you as a fan, you as a reader will pick up that book go to the cashier, buy it, and take it home with you. And that's exactly why professional wrestling and the publishing world go hand in hand. If you as a wrestler want to build your character, want to build your brand, and you can't tell me who you are, then you lost your fans. That's it. If you're able to grab me within the two minutes or less, then you gain a fan. It's as simple as that. You got to think about it as telling somebody who you are as a blurb. And why they should care about you and obviously show off your charisma. Important storylines that have to keep going versus the squash matches that no one cares about. I want to care about everybody. That's what happened from start to finish. With these AEW shows, I cared about every single person that showed up. I cared about every single story that showed up. I cared about AEW, the brand. And this entire episode could just be a learning experience for those that are listening. And for those that are listening, I thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, then please make sure to comment via either Twitter, even on Anchor. You can leave a voice message if you want. All right, guys, that's all for me. I want to do a contrast podcast episode because the last episode that i did i was completely frustrated i broke down everything i was like aew should not be turning into wwe but sometimes when you work for a company long enough it just stays on you 
the WWE mark just stays on you sometimes. And I wanted something a little bit lighter, something that I can do a compare and contrast as to why I'll get upset with this match versus not getting upset with this match and break down characters and what their characters would do in said situations. It's the same thing when you're writing a novel. If you have your main character, if you establish that your main character has a fear of spiders, but then in a situation where this character is put into, doesn't no longer have it, and there's no reason why this person doesn't have it, then that's right there where you failed and have to go back to the drawing board and fix it up. Now, I can understand if you put your main character in a scenario where, like, he or she is trapped in a cage of spiders and they have to get over it in order to get out and survive. That's different. That's a reason. You're giving them motivation as to why they should get over their fear of spiders. But if there is no explanation and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, spiders don't bother me. But in chapter one, you establish very well that the main character is afraid of spiders. You know, it doesn't make sense. In professional wrestling, even though a lot of things don't make sense because we're suspending our disbelief and we should not always have a reality base behind it, but it's a totally different era. It's a totally different time. Some things have to make sense and some things have to be very true to what they are. So that that's all I'm saying. Um, again, if you would like to leave your comments I am on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at Marie underscore shadows, or you could also find the square circle pod on uh, Twitter as well. If you want to leave your message via anchor, anchor is a popular podcast hosting website where you can leave a voicemail for yours. Truly Marie shadows. I will listen to it. I will respond to it and maybe I'll play it on a future episode of this podcast. If you also want to email me your thoughts, you can email me at squaredcirclepodcast at outlook.com. And if you want to join the wrestling newsletter, I thank you guys for tuning in on this episode of the Square Circle Podcast, talking about AEW Dynamite and AEW Dark and breaking down the characters and the matches. This is what I love to do. This is my passion. If any of you guys want to suggest anything, again, just leave me a comment. I will see you guys in the next episode.